right, Freedom Sunday. We talk about it like it's a day, right? That's what we're doing today. It's Freedom Sunday. It's our Sunday once a year that we're talking about it. But today has to be just the start. It can't just be we talk about it and leave. Okay, Freedom Sunday is a movement. It needs to leave these walls when we leave them. We can't keep it here or anything we talk about today doesn't matter even a little bit. All right. Today we're talking about human trafficking. This term's become pretty widely known in the last few years. But what it really means is that even though we in America had a civil war and papers were signed and laws were made and people were released into their freedom, there are still slaves in the world today. And believe it or not, there are still slaves in this country today. So let's talk facts, let's talk stats, okay? 50 million people, as of 2021, it is estimated that 50 million people are living in slavery worldwide, okay? Let's think about that for a minute. The state of California has a population of just over 39 million. There are more slaves in the world today than people that live in the state of California. 20 million more slaves in the world than the number of people that live in the state of California. That's a lot. According to the Polaris Project, which is a large project that works with human trafficking in the U.S., in 2020, there were 10,583 situations where human trafficking was reported. That's 10,000 situations where human trafficking was reported in the U.S. That's not worldwide. And out of those 10,000 situations that were reported, which means there were more that were not reported, there were over 16,000 victims involved in those cases. It's a lot of people. A lot of people. So what is human trafficking? How does it happen? What does it look like? It's not an easy thing to label because it takes on many faces. But let's look at some of the myths of what human trafficking is not and talk about what the truth behind those myths are, all right? So myth number one, human trafficking is always a violent crime. Always. Nope. All right. It's not Liam Neeson going overseas and finding his daughter because his daughter was kidnapped and being held somewhere hostage. Like, that's not it. We think of human trafficking that was that way. It's not what it is. All right? It's not always a kidnapping. It's not always forcing someone into a situation. In reality, traffickers trick, they manipulate, and they threaten their victims to make them do what they want them to do. Traffickers target victims they don't know. We hear about it on the news, right? The guy came into the store and followed the girl around and took her when she went out to her car. He didn't know her. There's no way. Unfortunately, that's also not the case. 85% of survivors report having known their traffickers. 85%. What that means is that significant others, including spouses, and family members, including parents, are also traffickers. And that's sad. Only undocumented foreign nationals get trafficked in the U.S. There's no U.S. citizens. It's only the people who are here that aren't supposed to be here that are being trafficked, right? Not true. In fact, many of the people who are trafficked are immigrants who migrated here legally and are living here legally and are working here legally and even U.S. citizens. Yes, people come in from overseas who are not here legally through trafficking, but that is not the only human trafficking that's happening here. Only men are traffickers. And the women and the girls, they're the victims, right? 
That's how this works. Men are traffickers. They're, they're bad, bad, bad men. Unfortunately, worldwide, 30% of all traffickers are female. A third of them. A third of the traffickers are female. And as far as women being the only victims, men and young boys, specifically, are targeted when they are in communities of homelessness or substance abuse or even the LGBTQ community are heavily targeted by traffickers. Human trafficking only happens in illegal industries. Nope. Human trafficking cases have been reported and prosecuted. Okay, so not just like, hey, I think something bad is going on over here. Somebody should go check it out. No. They were reported, and there was enough evidence to take them to court and try them for human trafficking. In industries including restaurants, cleaning services, construction, factories, and the list can go on and on. Things we use every day. Trafficking involves moving, traveling, or transporting a person across state or national borders. Right? There's no way it stays right here. Not true. Human trafficking is often confused with human smuggling. Okay? Human smuggling requires you to like take somebody and move them. Human trafficking doesn't. In fact, the crime of human trafficking doesn't require any movement at all. Victims can be recruited and trafficked right in their own hometowns, even in Rural America, small town, middle of Pennsylvania. It can happen. Labor trafficking is only a problem in developing countries. It's the countries that don't have a lot of money or their governments are collapsing or whatever else where the trafficking is happening. Also, not true. Labor trafficking occurs in the U.S and other very developed countries. But it is reported at a lower rate than sex trafficking, so it doesn't always get as much knowledge. Agriculture is a big area for human trafficking. All right, I'm gonna ruin something for you, I'm sorry. Your tomatoes, probably picked by somebody who is being trafficked. Even those that are used at the big restaurants that you go to, your Burger King, your Subway, your tomatoes were probably picked by someone who is currently living in a situation that they are not choosing to be in. Ultimately, human trafficking is a case of people who are vulnerable. Because of a lack of income, lack of education, mental illness, substance abuse, homelessness, involvement in the foster system, being alone or being an outcast, Anything that separates them from other people. Anything that gets them by themselves or leaves them alone. It causes a reason for them to search, to need, and find a way to seek fulfillment of their needs. Human trafficking can happen to anyone. Traffickers identify and leverage any vulnerability they can find in order to create a dependency for the person, for the victim that they are trafficking. So what do we do about it? It's ugly, it's gross, but obviously each of us have nothing to do with it, right? There's no way we touch any of it, right? Not even close, not even close. Do you get that? Like, we can't go to the store and not see something that has been brought here or worked on or created or picked or planted, any of it. It's on our grocery shelves. It's on all the shelves when we go to the clothing stores. It's there. Slavery is in every piece of what we do. It is as much a part of your everyday life as brushing your teeth or washing your hair or getting dressed or eating lunch. And before that 50 million 
number can go away, we need to realize that we feed into slavery of other human beings. And it could just as easily be someone we're passing at sheets as we leave or a kid that our kids go to school with. Once we let that hit us and sink in, that's when we can start doing something about it. Once that feeling of doom kind of settles in and sits on your shoulders, it gives us a place to move from. So let's look at 2 Chronicles. This is a story about a group of people who are seeing that doom. And it's not about slavery, okay? It's not about saying, oh, look, these people had slavery and they did this about it. But this, this story is about of people who are seeing what is happening and there's no, they have no way of getting out of it. They don't know what they're going to do, how they're going to move forward from this place. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at their story and see how we can use those principles to combat modern-day slavery. All right, so this is Second Chronicles 20, all right, this is verse 2. After this time, the armies of the Moabites, Ammonites, and some of the Menunites declared war on Jehoshaphat. Messengers came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army from Adam is marching against you from beyond the Dead Sea. They're coming, right? Those armies are coming. These people clearly are aware that something bad's going to happen. What do you, what do, you do when something bad happens? I know for me, like, the emotions start coming up, right? And I, like, I can feel it, like, in, like, the pit. And then sometimes, like, I feel my shoulders go up and my voice gets louder. And, like, they just, they come. And, and there's things that happen. And I feel them. And I can feel them start rising up. And when we feel emotions, whether it's anger or fear or sadness or even love or joy, we react our bodies do something. We can run, we can scream, we can cry, we can hug. But these actions, they're not strategic, they're not thought out, they're not planned. But these verses here and the ones that follow us, that we're going to read next, set out a pattern of a response that we can follow. All right, so these next verses are three and four. And it says, Jehoshaphat was terrified by the news. He was scared, right? Okay, Jehoshaphat, he's the king, the guy in charge, and he's scared. And he begged the Lord for guidance. He also ordered everyone in Judah to begin fasting. So people from all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. The king is scared. And the king, generally when you think of kings, like they've got it going on, right? They know what's happening. They know what to do. They're in charge. They have control. Jehoshaphat doesn't stand there and say, you guys go do this, and we're going to need weapons, so you go do this, and you need to go here, and you do this, and gather all the food, and make sure that the camp is right here, and we're doing this, and we're going here, and this is when to do it. What he does is he begs the Lord for guidance. Not even just asks, he begs the Lord for guidance. The first action is to turn toward God. The king Jehoshaphat asks God for guidance and then tells his people to fast. This is an appropriate first action to emotions. We turn to God. If there's any fear, any problem, or injustice, we turn to God. But moving from the emotion to the action isn't enough. You have to do it in obedience. All right, let's take a look at the next verses. Jehoshaphat stood before the community of Judah in Jerusalem in front of the new courtyard at the temple of the Lord. He prayed, O Lord, God of our ancestors, you alone are God who is in heaven. You are ruler of all the kingdoms of the earth. You are powerful and mighty. No one can stand against you. O our God, did you not drive out those who lived in this land when your people, is, people Israel arrived? Did you not give them this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham. Your people settled here and built this temple to honor your name. They said, whenever we are faced with any calamity, such as war, plague, or famine, 
we can come to stand in your presence before this temple where your name is honored. We can cry out to you to save us and you will hear us and rescue us. And now we see the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir are doing. You would not let our ancestors invade those nations when Israel left Egypt. So they went around them and did not destroy them. Now see how they reward us? For they have come to throw us out of your land, which you gave us as an inheritance. Oh, our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us. We do not know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. All right, here we see that the king acknowledges that God is powerful. Verse 6, you are the ruler of the kingdoms. You are powerful and mighty. No one can stand against you. Because of this, the people worship God and ask God to intervene in this situation. In verse 12, right, this is the powerful one. It says, we don't know what to do. We don't know what to do. There are 50 million people out there in slavery, and we don't know how to make that stop. But our eyes are on you. Our eyes are on God. This is a picture of faith. It's a picture of trust. It's a picture of hope. All right, think about those passages for a minute. God is all-powerful, right? The creator, the sustainer, and savior. And yet he invites us to be his friend and to look at him and turn that control that we want to have over. Our reality isn't shaped by current events, okay? But by doing a long look at history and creation of what God has full control over. In the chaos of our everyday lives, we need to keep in mind that God is not powerless. <laughs> in times of uncertainty and difficulty, our best response is to say, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you, God. And when we operate within that context of worship, we stand in God's presence, and we cry out, and we sing, and we celebrate. And that's what they did too. As all the men of Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children, the Spirit of the Lord came upon one of the men standing there. His name was Jahaziel, son of, and a lot of whole other names because they like to tell you where they came from. <laughs> he said, listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem, listen, King Jehoshaphat, this is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Don't be discouraged by how big this problem is. Okay, God showed up. God tells them, look here. Look here and stop your worrying. All right, that's my paraphrase. He doesn't actually say that. But that's what he says. You, you see these big problems. You know it exists. Look at me for answers and stop worrying about it. Then he tells them the battle's not theirs. Our human nature wants us to be in control, right? We take too much responsibility sometimes. But the battle isn't ours. This battle on slavery needs to be God's. This doesn't mean that we sit passively, okay? It's not about saying, okay, God, I can't do anything, so go deal with it. It's about partnering with him and knowing that he is in full control. Freedom Sunday, the set free movement, doesn't rescue slaves. All right? Jesus is our savior, and only Jesus can rescue slaves. But we can stand in God's presence and turn our eyes to him and follow what he is saying. Here's the rest of the instructions that these people were given. Tomorrow, march out against them. You will find them coming up through the ascent of Ziz at the end of the valley that opens into the wilderness of Drool. But you will not even need to fight. Take your positions. 
Then stand still a watch, and watch the Lord's victory. He is with you, O people of Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. Then King Jehoshaphat bowed low with his face to the ground, and the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites from the clans of Koath and Korah stood to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud shout. Right? They're being called to action by God this time, okay? And not only is God calling them to action, but he is giving them yet another reassurance to not fear or worry. And even though they are facing the impending doom, all those people marching toward them, the people worship. Some of them even worship with a very loud shout. Here's what happens. <laughs> Early the next morning, the army of Judah went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. On the way, Jehoshaphat stopped and said, Listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets, and you will succeed. After consulting the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. This is what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. At the very moment they began to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting among themselves. So they show up. <laughs> and these armies that were coming to attack them and kick them out of their land are now down in the valley where they were supposed to be fighting, fighting each other. They have nothing to worry about anymore. God acted within their worship. The best initial response to the awfulness of human trafficking is not just awareness. It's not emotion. It's not human effort, all right? It's not us going out there and hunting down or trying to even pull people out of slavery ourselves. The first step is worship. In worship, we acknowledge that God is above all things. Worship sets us in line with the true reality of God working in history and through his creation. Working to end human trafficking and create new futures can only effectively be done by following the one who can set captives free. It's not our battle. We cannot end human trafficking. But God can. So, Centering on Jesus and allowing the Spirit to move us into action is why observing Freedom Sunday is so important. On Freedom Sunday, we are guided by a few principles, and we're going to talk about them, okay? And this is, these are not like, oh, go do this. These are not the action step principles, okay? These are ways to center your mind, your heart, your life on worshiping God. So first... Our initial response needs to be to turn to God, acknowledging God's power and friendship. We want to be more than emotionally charged. We seek to partner with God in transformational action. We're not just going and doing, but we're looking for something that is going to transform the situation. We want more than reaction. We want spirit Build action. We want to see more than captives being set free. We want God to transform lives and communities. Let's face it, even if we all went in, all right, on a good day, there's what, 200 of us? If we all went in and we all rescued as many people as we could, there are still slaves in the world. 
And even if by some miracle we could all go in, we could all rescue all 50 million people who are currently living in slavery, the people who put them in slavery are still there, and they're going to turn right around and find somebody else to fall in those holes. And honestly, there are times where the people who are being trafficked don't want out. And even if you pull them out of a situation, they're going to turn right back around and go right back to the person who trafficked them in the first place. We know God is in control, leading us into battle. And we want worship to be the catalyst for action. We don't want to just do. We want to focus on God. We want it to be all about him. Okay, those are some really big thoughts. There's some really big God thoughts, some really big spiritual thoughts, and it's a lot. So what can we practically do from here, focusing on God, to help the slavery issue? There is this really neat website. So it's slaveryfootprint.org. And you can see this is their title page, and it says, How many slaves work for you? And there is a survey. I think it's 10 or 11 questions. I did it yesterday, but I can't remember exactly how many there are. Um, and it goes through and it asks you where you live. It asks you how old you are. It asks you how many people are in your family, what type of media and entertainment you do, um, and where, like, what you like to eat, where you buy your clothes. Um, and some of them are quick click-through questions, but they also allow you to, like, pull out this extra whole section where you can, like, refine everything. So, like, I put in that I have four kids. Well, when you go in and look at the kids section, then they, like, break down how many toys of each kind they have. And so if you really want to get into it, you can, like, change those numbers as well and get a more accurate number. But by the end of it, after you hit total and you hit submit and everything, what it does is it tells you the number of slaves based off of everything that you consume that are working for you. And when you put everything in, like, and you get that number, and you're like, I try to be conscious. Like we, like, we in our house are very conscious of what we wear and what we eat, and yet our number wasn't zero. And that number will hit you hard. <laughs> in, in that, you can pay attention to what you're consuming, okay? So... There are some big ticket items that almost always have companies that deal in human trafficking for their labor. Uh, one of the big ones is coffee and clothing. Cosmetics is terrible, awful for human trafficking. Uh, today, actually, there's a, or there's a coffee roaster in New York that it works with Set Free, and they've created their own blend specifically for Freedom Sunday. They call it the Freedom Blend. We have some of that available for purchase out there. It actually, when you purchase that, a quarter, so 25% of every purchase goes directly back to Set Free so they can continue to plug in where it needs to be. There are also, on the same table the coffee is on, little half-sheet pamphlets that tell you how you can find out what companies are good and which ones are not. Um, and then attached to that is a sheet that has a list of companies by category that tell you where is good to shop or brands to get. Uh, all of the ones on that sheet have a grade A. They grade them A through F. Everything on that sheet is graded A. And then the website you can find on the other sheet that tells you how to find more options. You could get involved in local impact. We have a local impact team here. I've been working with Set Free. Those people on the video that we saw first, I've been in meetings with them talking about how we in Phillipsburg can reduce the vulnerable population. How do we serve them so that vulnerabilities go down and people who are coming off of I-80 aren't looking at people in our community to manipulate. If you are a business owner, there is something called Percent for Freedom. With this, what you are able to do is you are able to allocate a certain percentage, you get to choose how much that is, on a certain day or every day if you choose, 
that your business donates out of profits from that time period towards set free. It's a whole system they have set up. We can talk more about it if you're interested. You are able to support world missions. We talked a little bit about it yesterday, but these people who are in countries all over the world see trafficking every day. A lot of them deal with it on a daily basis. And the last thing I have is ICCM. So ICCM is the child care ministries through the Free Methodist Church. When you support a child, you're paying for their food, and you're paying for their school, and you're paying for some of their other needs. And when they don't have to figure out a way to get those needs met, they're not falling into the trafficking schemes because they don't need it. So as you're sitting here today, think about what you're doing, how you're doing it. Let the emotions come up and rise up inside of you. Recognize those emotions and focus on God and ask him, what is your next step in fighting human trafficking? Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, We've just looked at a whole lot of really big things, a whole lot of super heavy stuff, stuff that is upsetting and makes me angry and makes me want to go do things, Lord. But Lord, I know that we need to stay focused on you. So please, Lord, focus our eyes on who you are. Let us know that this battle is yours and show us what role we play in it as we worship you, Father. Amen.